You alluded to what it was like growing up with your mother. What kind of mother was she? You know, I can't say that we actually had a relationship growing up. I mean, my mother was a well, you know, single mom. We grew up, we grew up, you know, kind of poor, and um, so there was some alcoholism. Um, you know, we got whooped, we got yelled at a lot. We knew I have three sisters. I mean, two sisters. I'm the oldest of of uh, three, so we knew that we had to act a certain way. We knew we had to be cautious in certain in certain um, situations. Um, you internalized and knew what your mother was going through. You understood like yeah. the place that she was in and you knew how to react based on that. We exactly that we we definitely you had to learn how to read someone. You know, from the moment my mother woke up until the, she went to bed, I had to figure out how to protect myself. And I'm not saying that she was in there beating on me, but just like when, you know, when someone is in survival mode, they can project that onto you. So it'll be a look, it'll be a tone of voice, it'll be, it, it would be getting hit sometimes, being yelled at, name calling. Um, and so you have to figure out like, what can I say? What can I do to make everything easier? And that's a lot to do as a child because you can't be a child anymore. You have to be quiet. You have to go sit down somewhere. You can't question anything. Um, and that's, that's not what I, I definitely did not want that for my, my own house at all. When you finally realized you were pregnant, Gia was coming into the world, you started reading parenting mm-hmm. books, experts. Mm-hmm. What were those books and those experts not giving you as a Black mother? Yeah, I was reading. I remember I read Brain Rules for Baby. I really wanted to understand what brain development because I, I didn't understand that. That was important to me. And that's how I, that's how I got drawn into positive parenting and the gentle parenting movement. And so I went and sought out um, parent coaches and parent experts in that in that area. I came across people like Janet Lansbury and Rebecca Eanes and, um, you know, white women. And so when I would mm-hmm. go onto their pages and I'm looking at them, I'm just like, this does not seem realistic for me. Like, mm-hmm. I don't talk like this. I don't, it's like, who talks like this? <laughs> and mm-hmm. so I, I went and I found a Black... A positive parenting group. And I joined that group. And that was what really helped educate me. Um, it really helped me to see that there was so many more of us doing this work, that I wasn't alone, and that I could ask questions in a safe way. Only problem was that group was also full of respectability, which I, at that point, I was becoming more radicalized. So mm. as I'm going down this journey to positive parenting, I'm also starting my decolonizing journey. I'm also realizing like there's a really big piece missing in how we talk about parenting with black parents. So this group was so respectable that I was getting that I was just like, I got to start my own shit because I can't do this with y'all. And when you say respectable, what do you mean by that? I mean that if we we still have people in this group, this black parenting group saying things like race doesn't matter, saying things like um, it, the founder of the group said something to the effect of my sons get really upset whenever they see a black girl and they and he says hi and they don't smile. I really I really think that, you know, we need to figure out how to teach our black girls like how to be more friendly. And I was just like, let me you, you ain't got to worry about me. Let me grab my shit. Let me go. Because this is the kind of stuff. I was like, man, you lost your damn mind. Teach your son that we that we do not have to smile and, and giggle for him. I, I was like, this is this is this is feeling this is feeling real, real uh, uh, patriarchal white supremacist up in here. So let me let me go ahead and go on. So I, I got with another friend of mine and we started our group. Um, but even as I'm in that group and, and the people are joining and we're, and we're discussing it, I'm still doing my own research about decolonizing. Like it really just came to me like I really want to understand the origin story of things. I really want to get to the root of things. I always say this, I'm here to center Black parents and Black people in this um, in this decolonizing journey. Let's talk a little bit more about that, because I'm really struck by the use of adult supremacy. And I think I know yeah, what you're yeah. talking about. You describe parenting your daughter as being a co-creator 
of her life. Mm -hmm. That is really interesting. What does being a co-creator look like with a child? So um, Gia is four. She's autistic. She is non-speaking. Um, and I still feel like we are trying to co-create and I say trying because I don't always get it right, <laughs> but we yeah. are, we are trying to co-create together. And what that means for me is I'm allowing her to teach me stuff and I, and she, and I teach her at the same time. I learned from Gia a lot. I've learned how to not control people. I've learned that because you, you can't really have like love and ownership. It, it, they can't coexist. And I feel like if, if we really look into the parent-child relationships, it's it's ownership-based, the way parents talk about children, um, mm-hmm. the way that we think about their behavior and how it reflects on us, when really it's just a reflection of their immature brains, you know? And mm. so when I think about co-creating, I'm just thinking about the fact that she is a whole person without me. She is not my mini-me. She is her. She is Gia. She has thoughts and feelings and and wants and things that I need to learn in order to allow her to be herself. The one thing I never want to do is make her feel like who she is is not good enough because that's how I felt growing up. But as I parent her, I want her to be, look at me as not just this authority figure. I want her just to see me as someone that she's safe with, someone that almost like almost like intergenerational like solidarity because she Mm. is able to make decisions sometimes and do things sometimes that I didn't realize she could do because I didn't let her do them. So it's like me backing the hell off and just being like, let me see what, what you're capable of. And then when I see she needs my help, that's when I can step in. I'm not saying be hands off. Children need discipline. They need guidance. They need structure. When you don't have those things and you start going into permissive parenting, that's a whole other type of abuse because then your child really feels like you don't give a damn. So at the heart of your work is your desire for your daughter to be liberated and carefree and confident. And I agree with you on that. But when I read that, I thought about how so many times in my life I've heard people say with a little disdain in their voice, specifically black folks, well, white parents let their kids just do anything, Mm -hmm. be free, as Mm -hmm. if that is an amoral position to be in, to let your children be themselves. Say more about that. Do you hear the programming? There's programming there. That's a program. Be programmed to not see ourselves as free, as equal as the as people who are uh, fully um, humans, we're programmed to see ourselves that way, and they're programmed to see us that way. So that's why when people are like, um, "That's some white people stuff," I'm just like, "Who told you that? Who told you that?" Because last time I checked, our ancestors back, you know, on these plantations, they learned how to be parents from white people. So who told you that? We learned this brutality from white people. The majority of people in this country are white. So can we stop pretending like it's only black folks that are that are violent or 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 white folks that are able to be loving and and gentle? That's not the case. I think at the heart of it though consciously people are thinking, "Oh, I'm keeping my black children safe." It's not about letting my child do and be who they are. It's about them being safe. And that's the constant tightrope, even me, that I walk as I'm doing this work. I'm, I'm never going to be at the final destination of conscious parenting. This is, it's a journey. Um, and it, it, it changes as Gia grows and as I grow, you know, and as I age. Um, the thing is, we know historically, because of the violence of whiteness, that our children can be snatched from us at any time. We know this. Um, we discuss intergenerational trauma, but we, we, we talk about it from, the, from a place of we're passing down this trauma to, to our children. But what we're really passing down is an awareness of whiteness. What we're passing down is um, almost like an innate, like we need to survive this. We, we're constantly walking around in fear 
and anxious and um, nothing, nothing good can ever come from that. But I'm looking at it more of a, as a survival technique. I'm looking at it as my body can, knows, looking at my daughter, like, I got to keep her safe. But I, re- I refuse to be the oppressor in order to keep her safe. To this point you're making, there was this study done back in 2015 by Pew Research that found that we hold on to this belief that physical discipline is necessary to keep Black children out of the streets, out of prison, out of police officers' sight. But it doesn't do that. We adopted Mm -hmm. this practice of beating children from white slave masters. This is well documented. And historians have found no evidence that this form of physical discipline existed before West African societies came here during the slave trade. But somewhere along the way, we adopted this idea that beating our children is biblical. How did that happen? This is why I like to look at things from a systemic point of view. It's like systems thinking. Because when you start to look at it that way, you realize how all of these systems play into each other, right? So so we have... Um, the systems of like capitalism, patriarchy, white supremacy at the top. And then what comes underneath those things are all the isms, the racism, the sexism, the childism. In the middle of those, what keeps all of that in place is religion. Because if we didn't have religion, you wouldn't be able to oppress uh, the black people. You wouldn't be able to dehumanize them that way. You wouldn't have been able to do that to women. You wouldn't be able to do that to children. So when we start looking at these systems and how they all work together, it really behooves us to be like, who does this benefit for us to continue to do this? Now, everybody who says spare the world and spoil the child, I need for y'all to go to your closets, and pull out every piece of polyester that you own and toss it out because that's also in the Bible. You're not supposed to be wearing mixed fabrics, okay? <laughs> You're not supposed to eat bacon. You're not supposed to eat shellfish. You're not supposed right. to... You, you know, they talk about having multiple wives. It is not meant to be taken in that way. First of all, the the that verse is not even in there. It, it's that particular, like that exact saying is not in the oh, Bible. Oh, really? That is a poem that someone wrote, a white man wrote. What I believe the verse is, he who um, spares the rod hateth the, the child. I think that's the one, but it's, but that, that particular, that exact thing is not, is not in the Bible. N- numero uno. But number two, the rod is to guide. And you don't, mm. I told someone. Oh, wait, wait, recently, slow down, slow, slow okay. down here, Yolanda. The rod is the guide. So are you saying yeah. that this is not a literal translation that a rod is like a switch? Exactly. You know, the Bible has has it, it has all these metaphorical teachings that we you have to you know, that's why we use preachers to help us understand all these metaphors and everything that. But for some reason, you really took the rod to be literal people. Y'all be doing too much. It's a guide. The rod is a guide. And when you look at a shepherd, the shepherd, we're not talking about a shepherd in somebody's backyard garden. We're talking about Middle East, North Africa. And they used to shepherd all of these sheep hundreds at a time across, you know, the pastures and everything else. What the, these sheep are not stupid. They're not going to follow a, 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 a shepherd that's beating them. They're, they have survival instincts. They will run away. Hmm. So the rod was used to gently guide them, and keep them in place. They would walk and when the, the sheep was coming over, they would use the rod to gently put them back. So they were following, you know, the path to go to the next pasture. They're not going up to that sheep, cussing the sheep out and beating it upside its head. The sheep would then run away and every other sheep would run away with it because then you're not longer safe. The, the sheep trusted the shepherd. The sheep knew, like, this, these people feed me and they keep me safe. Punishment is violent. Punishment is someone taking that rod and, and beating a sheep. But discipline is guidance. Discipline is, is teaching someone for the future. Punishment is punishing someone revenge almost for the past. So when you are talking to your children and you're just like, you did this and I'm upset now and I'm about to whoop you. 
I want to know how is that going to teach them how to make a different decision in the future. And I think the issue is that we have really internalized that we deserve violence, that we cannot, we cannot learn without it. Because I want to understand how um, you feel like your child cannot possibly learn without, without being hurt. And I'm not just talking about physical. I'm talking about verbally, too, because a lot of parents yep. will be like, well, I don't hit my child. But then you cussing them out or calling them names or making them do military exercises or putting them in timeout, which is pretty much isolation. And mm -hmm. I want us to also look at the parallels to the carceral system because we're out here in these streets marching, talking about how our lives matter. But then we go home and we duplicate harmful systems of oppression in the carceral state and in white supremacy and in patriarchy. Like how, how'd that work? We have to look at who is this benefiting for us to continue on this path? Because if we really look outside these windows and in this world and, and historically, uh, you know, most people across race and cultures hit their kids. Is it working? Is this world a better place? Right. Are we more prosperous? That's the question. Is it, does it right. seem to be effective to you? Right. Before we mm -hmm. get, though, to that, you first have to work on yourself, like you said, deprogramming yourself. Mm -hmm. And I want to talk with you about how you got there. What were your triggers when you first became a mom? I mean, mine, for instance, when I realized that trauma was a real thing and it was man, mm -hmm. it was it was presenting itself in the parenting of my children was when my daughter was yeah. really young and she would cry and whine and I would get angry inside instead mm -hmm. of feeling compassionate. Yeah, me too. Still do. I'm not perfect. I'm not, a, I, I do not claim to be um, an expert because I am still growing and healing. You know, Gia's only four. I didn't want to have kids. I have to reconcile all the trauma I had growing up, the abusive relationships that I was in as an adult, all of these things that you just are still with me. I tell people all the time, like the best thing we could do for ourselves as parents is see ourselves as human first, because mm -hmm. parent is just another identity. It is not my whole identity. So I want to make sure that I am, cause I am humanizing myself through this process. I have so many triggers, Cry like excessive crying is one of them. And I think it's because I wasn't able to really cry. <laughs> Were you able to really mm. cry? No. In fact, my mom I would get, say, oh, I hate when kids cry. I hate when you cry. Do anything but cry. And so I, I, I internalize that. You internalize for sure. that. And so I think that's why it's, it's, it's about investigating and doing that mindset work, right? Because once you start investigating, like, not just what are my triggers, but why are my triggers? Why are they there? Um, you start to look, you start to really un uncover trauma that you didn't even know you had sometimes. And we have a choice. We can give in or we can continue to, you know, we can project that trauma onto them. And so when I see, you know, stuff coming up for me, I have to, I have to like calm down. I have to like sit and, and I do little things like I have mantras that I give, that I say to remind me of who she is and what I want. I had to do it before I even picked her up to calm my body down. I had to say to myself, she's only a baby and she just needs you and you're safe. Because what your what your mind is doing in that moment is kicking into that fight or flight. And this is why it's so important, so important for us to really understand how we work, um, how our brains work and everything else. Because once your brain goes into uh, flight or fight, your nervous system starts getting activated. Your body is telling you that this child is a threat to you. It's telling you that this baby who's crying is a threat to you and you need to keep yourself safe from it. So you have to, if you're in survival mode, which I was, you have to be intentional about calming down before you even like are able to engage sometimes. So I would do that. She would be crying and I would calm myself down and then I would pick her up and be able to offer her gentleness. No, I had to just calm myself down. We matter too. And a big yep. part of this decolonizing journey is 
is humanizing parents. A big issue I have with the positive parenting community is how I feel like they it's they don't recognize parents' humanity. I feel like they don't recognize the uh, privilege that it takes to be able to parent this way very well. You know, being yeah. a single mom, um, not having any sleep, not having any time, not having food, not having, if you don't have a roof over your head or if you're struggling to keep one over your head, all these things impact you being able to be a positive parent or a conscious parent. And none of that is talked about. That compassion that you have to have for yourself too, yes. because you know it's so consequential, you have another human being who depends on you and everything you do, you know, has a, a longer term impact because you see it in yourself with, mm -hmm. your, with your mother and the way that she treated mm -hmm. you. And I'm thinking about how that compassion that you extend to yourself also has to be extended to the people who raised you. How have you come to that in the forgiveness or the understanding of your own mother? So this is a sore point for a lot of folks. I, I, I tell folks all the time, um, everyone at any given point is doing the best they can. And that is triggering for a lot of people because they really be like, my mom did not do her best. And like, Unfortunately, she did, but her best was just shitty. Her best was traumatic mm -hmm. for you. Her best was abusive. Her best was what she had based on her childhood, based on her adulthood, based on her socioeconomic status, based on her ability to be able to manage her emotions. That's the best that she can give you. That hurts to hear because it sucks, but it's the truth. And so when I really understood that is when I was able to extend compassion. And I, and, I, and I got to that place after, you know, some years of therapy and really being able to see the person that my mom was and not just my mom and being able. And then finally, like listening to her, asking her questions about her childhood, um, asking her questions about how she felt about us and really getting a different perspective. You know, as children, we have our own memories. They're, they're valid, but sometimes they may not be our memories. If you look at memory processing, sometimes our memories don't process the truth. That's just real. I know. I'm so fascinated by this too, right? Like that we have different, we could be in the same room and we have totally different interpretations of what happened. I hear this with my child. My daughter's 15 now and she talks about her childhood and she, she'll bring up certain things. And I'm like, where was I? Because this doesn't sound like me. Yeah. And it also doesn't sound like right. what happened. But it's her truth. It's her truth. And if someone were to, were to strap her up to a lie detector test, she would pass. It's her truth. It's what happened to her based on her perspective. You know what I'm saying? And our memories are colored by our perspective about life. And so I had to look, I had to ask her questions about like how she felt about being a parent. Um, so I could stop believing this lie that I wasn't wanted or that yeah. I was a burden in some capacity. And I realized it had nothing to do with me, it had nothing to do with me. I just didn't know that as a child. And that's why it's so important for us to actually speak to our children, A, speak to them with respect. But when you don't, and when you, when you are disrespectful and you apologize, I always include, you didn't deserve that and it wasn't about you. She's only four and she hears this constantly. I'm always apologizing to her. Yolanda, this is pretty bold, though, because I was actually just watching a YouTube video where it was like black moms be like, and they do something wrong to you and they never apologize. No, they'll just be like, do you want something to eat? <laughs> right, yeah. right. You saw the same well, thing. Eat. Yeah. yeah. I just think about how impactful it would have been to hear, I'm sorry, or just to hear like, this is this is nothing to do with you. This is not about you. You don't deserve, you didn't deserve that. I was just, you know, and I try not to make excuses when I apologize. Like I say, I, mama was upset. I should have spoken to you that way. I apologize. You didn't deserve that. And I don't know if she understands any of it, really. I just want to get into the habit of doing it. And I want her to get, I want to normalize that for her. Right, because it goes back to your idea of co-creating a life in all relationships, yeah. if we're talking about even mm -hmm. romantic relationships or friendships, there is that yes. that mutual respect for each other where you're apologizing if you've done something wrong. Why wouldn't we give that same 
grace and understanding to our children. Adult supremacy. So like that, going back there, <laughs> it's just because we feel like children aren't just like we as parents, because we are the um, the people who go out and make a living and pay the bills and all this stuff. We see it as. I feel like a lot of parents sort of are keeping tabs when it comes to what they do for their children mm. and their children are in debt to them. That's what I feel like a lot of parents feel like my child is in debt to me. So they may apologize, but mostly I'm putting a roof over your head. I'm right. going, I, I work at this terrible job just so I can feed you. There's, right. you know, I'm sacrificing my life, my body, all this stuff just for your existence. And so I don't owe you an apology. As a matter of fact, go clean your room. Like it just, I feel like that's the attitude a lot of parents have. <laughs> like, Kids asked to be here for some reason. Yeah, even like, you know, we don't do it anymore, but we used to hail up the Cosby show and the Cosby's is the perfect family. But even in that scenario, Bill Cosby was saying yeah. to Theo, I put a roof over your head. I put you in this world. I could take you out. We love that quote when he did that in the show, because that is exactly how we parent. You're right in this idea that they're indebted yep. to us. Um, and everything is kind of like a checkoff. How do you open this up beyond privileged people though, because I'm still going back to that fight or flight. So many of us are still in that. I think it's important to find your people um, and really seek out like-minded people because you need someone who's not going to first thing your child does something. The first thing they say is, well, maybe you should whoop them. Like you need folks who are really committed to this type of parenting, but also you don't have to go all the way in. There's a concept of unschooling called de-schooling. And this is just for parents who need to sort of decolonize their minds about how they feel about school. So you can do that and still put your kids in public school. That allows you to be able to advocate for them in a different way, right? So if they call it a schoolish mindset, you think about all the stuff that you're indoctrinated with, because school is like the biggest indoctrination tool into all these systems. Mm -hmm. And so you start thinking about all the things you learn, all the programming you learned from school. And then you think about like, do they serve the greatest, the greater purpose of raising a liberated child? And then you start kind of the, the easiest way to do this is just ask yourself why. So if your child is struggling and, and they're just like, I don't want to go to school. And instead of you saying you're going to go to school, it's questioning. Well, why don't you want to go to school? And every time there's a, every time you get an answer, you not only ask them why, but you're asking yourself why about your response to them. So if their response is, well, I don't like this. And you start to feel yourself getting upset. You start asking yourself, why does this upset me? What, why, why am I feeling this way about my child's response? Because just doing these sort of um, investigations into your own mindset really helps you to be more intentional and conscious and, and form deeper connections. Because then you start to answer them, not from a place of um, like parenting hierarchy, like you're, I'm the parent, you should just do this. But you start to see them and hear them and be able to, C collaborate and co-create with them. Yolanda, thank you so much for your work. I mean, this is really powerful stuff that you're doing. You're unpacking all of this within yourself for the benefit of us so that we can do it. You're giving us permission and showing us a way. And it's so powerful. And I feel so emotional about it because I love my children. Yeah. And I don't want to replicate yeah. the ways that I was harmed on them. So thank you. Girl, you got me over here about to start crying. Stop. <laughs> I'm gonna look like again. Yolanda Williams is a parenting coach and founder of Parenting Decolonized. She's created this wonderful list for caregivers called Be Intentional. Some of the gems include, what need is my child communicating? And will my response build or break my child's spirit? 
We have that checklist for you, along with more info on Parenting Decolonized on our website, DearTBT.com. As Yolanda said, part of this work of decolonizing our parenting practices is also giving grace to ourselves and the people who raised us. To forgive your parents for being human. In many ways, it's forgiving yourself for the missteps and mistakes we all make. I shared a little of this with my mom. Yeah, you know, the thing, the epiphany that I had when Yolanda told me that she grew up not feeling wanted was that I think when your parents are in a fight or flight state, like you, you were in survival mode yeah. as a single mother, yeah. that we as children can interpret that is that I am a burden versus mm. this is just a, a person who is trying to survive and make it and do the best for their kids. Mm-hmm. It really is an epiphany. Did you ever feel like that? I think there are, there are parts of it, you know, mm. when you say things like, you weren't planned. Those things, they they do make you feel like, well, if I wasn't a part of this, you know, things might be easier. Um, you just internalize it a little bit. Yeah, I can understand it. But now I understand it, though. Like, that is the gift of this conversation and learning this stuff is like, once I can see it, it doesn't mean that it doesn't hurt any less, but it makes me realize that it wasn't true. You, I'm, pr- I'm very proud of you. I'm very proud. I love you very much. And, I love you too, and, Mom, I would, and I'm proud of you too. And I would be so happy to whatever, anytime you want to ask me anything. I look forward to our conversations. I'm looking forward to sharing with you. And I... Uh, I'm going to re-examine myself to continue to try to grow. <laughs> oh, thank you, Mom. All right. Okay, how are you thinking about this quest to raise liberated children? I want to hear from you. Give me a call at 424-279-8425. That's 424-279-8425. And let me know your thoughts. You can also reach me at Tanya at DearTBT.com or use the hashtag on Twitter or Instagram, DearTBT. Truth Be Told is a production of TMI Productions and is produced by Ayana Angel, Aisha Brown, James T. Green, and Enrico Benjamin in collaboration with Molten Heart and in association with Fearless Media. Special thanks to Brittany Luce and Rochelle Roberts. We're distributed by DCP Entertainment. Our theme music is Rest by Otis McDonald and Zora's Moon by Candace Hoyes. And we're funded in part by the Heising Simons Foundation and the Ford Foundation. I'm Tanya Mosley, and until next time. <laughs>